This is the Leadership Lessons Podcast, hosted by Pastor Daniel Williams, a podcast to encourage and equip church leaders. Brought to you by eeleaders.com. Well, hello, everyone. I'm glad that you're back, and I am so excited to continue to grow in leadership with you. This is Leadership Lessons, and I'm your host, Daniel Williams, and I'm just excited to be continually learning with you, and I pray that these episodes are blessing you. Today is pretty exciting because we have our first guest lesson Andrew Lundy is going to be sharing with us. Now, Andrew just just currently planted Solace Church out in Boca Raton, Florida. That's right next to Delray Beach, and it's just been an answer to prayer. Because as you know, when you're laboring a field and in the community, you pray for more labors. I know that many of us want more labors to come into our church, our local context, but the reality is, is God sends people and He answers our prayers. We can have confidence in that. And we have just been so blessed in South Florida to be able to see God raise up these leaders, these amazing people, men and women of God, to go and start these churches and to share the gospel. And that's what we want. We want this gospel to go forth and God's kingdom to just be expanded by us faithfully obeying the call that he's called on our lives. And so Andrew is just one of those guys where I've got to spend time with, build a relationship with, and I just love rolling with these church planners. Uh, I have a heart for church planners and try to encourage as many people as possible. And it's funny because when I try to encourage them or they ask for advice for me, uh, thinking that I know something, I actually end up more encouraged and learn from them. Uh, it reminds me of Proverbs 11.25, which says, Whoever blesses will be enriched, and the one who waters himself will be watered. And I end up trying to enrich people's lives and encourage them, but yet at the same time, uh, I feel like myself, I'm being watered and blessed by just the fellowship that I get to have with all these great people in my life. And so, me and another leader went to Andrew's Vision Night. And he shared this incredible message that we were just blown away and so blessed by. I knew that I wanted to share it with people from my church, but also uh, the EE Leaders community. And so I asked Andrew to just share some thoughts about how Jesus gives vision, how vision comes from Jesus. And I am super excited to be able to share that with you. And you know, that's my hope for you, that you would seek Jesus, pursue Him, that you would abide in Christ. And it's so important for us as leaders to just be continually abiding in Christ and being reminded that that is the important work, that that is a great thing that we get to do is just be children of God, to be able to have a relationship with the living King Jesus. John 15, 4, I'm reminded of the words that Jesus told us. He said, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself and let it abides in me, well, neither can you unless you abide in me. See, I truly believe that ministry is an overflow of our hearts. And it's so important that we continue to cultivate our relationship and our love for Jesus. And so I asked another pastor friend of mine, Jim Gallagher, up at Vero Beach, Florida, Calvary Chapel, to just encourage us with this reality. That first, we're children of God. That we too should be seeking Jesus, not only for vision for the church body and for those that we lead, but also for our lives. And I just love his encouragement and his perspective that he gives on the One Piece of Advice video. And so, remember, all these videos, whether it be a guest video, a conversation, a One Piece of Advice video, they're all going to be found at eeleaders.com. You could watch them, you could listen to them, you could download them, you could share them. They're all for free for you. And so, I know that these videos are going to bless you by my friends Andrew Lundy and Jim Gallagher today. I hope you enjoy. How's it going? My name is Andrew Lundy. I'm a church planner in Boca Raton, Florida. It's in South Florida, pretty close to Delray Beach, uh, where Redemption Church is, and my good friend uh, Pastor Daniel Williams is pastoring. And i um, gotten to know Daniel uh, over the past year just through church planning. He's reached out and become a good friend and actually attended one of our church events, our church planning events that we had about a month ago. It was called Vision Night. And this was a night that we had where we invited people, friends, family, uh, to gather around and hear uh, what God was doing through our church. And um, as the name entails, it was a night to share vision. We called it Vision Night. And so some of the stuff I shared on that night, um, Pastor Daniel asked me if I would take a moment here to share it uh, with you. And so just would like to do that. So... um, 
you know, getting ready for a vision night for a church, certainly what you're thinking about mostly is, you know, what is our vision as a church? What, what, what are we going to share about in regards to what has God shown us and what's our plan? Um, for me, the, the process in preparing for that night, though, it, it wasn't just what am I going to share? What, what is our vision as a church? But the Lord really led me to think more and, and to think first about how does vision even come about in the first place? Um, and so I just wanted to share kind of what I feel the Lord has revealed to us. I mean, this has been our journey and our process and something that we see in the scriptures in regards to how God gives vision. What does that look like for us to be able to stand up before people and say, here's our vision as a church. What, what does it look like to get to that point? Um, so first, I think the probably the most important thing to start with is to give a somewhat of a preliminary definition of what we mean when we say vision. Obviously, vision has to do with seeing. Um, but when we say vision, I think we, we should clarify because it's a very, it's a very fluid word. It's a word that, you, that is used um, in a lot of different spheres. I mean, it, it's, it can be used in the business world to talk about our vision statement as a corporation. Uh, it could be used even on uh, the basketball court. It's an, it can be an athletic term when there's a point guard or a player that has really good court vision. Um, it could also be a confusing word, like you could have vision f for your vision and you can have vision for your mission. And I have a vision for my core value. So I don't know, I've just found that it's a word that is used a lot, but I think we need to maybe define sometimes what we mean when we use it. Not that it has to have one meaning, but um, for me, as I've kind of thought about it, when I uh, have thought about the word vision, I think one way that we, especially as leaders and ministry leaders, um, should think about the word vision. One way to think about it is this idea that we see in Scripture of seeing what God sees. Having eyes to see what God sees, which comes about by God's grace. It's a work of God's Spirit for us to be able to do that. Um, I think of Ephesians chapter 1 as, as a, a good foundation, scriptural foundational basis for this. Ephesians 1, Paul is praying this prayer for the church at Ephesus. And in Ephesians 1, he says this in verse 16, he says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And here's what he prays for this church. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. I think that's a great scriptural basis for what we mean sometimes when we say vision. We're talking about this work of God, this work of grace, for Him to open my eyes to see what I wouldn't, else, I wouldn't have seen elsewhere. Um, I think there's a process for this, right? Uh, there, there, there's, a, there's a pathway, there's a, there's a, there's a formation of, of how God does this, how God opens my eyes. And so I kind of want to share with you um, sort of a breakdown of what that looks like and what, that's, what I feel like that looks like and has looked like in my life and certainly what that seems to look like in Scripture, this, this theme. Now, um, it all starts, the idea of vision, Certainly, it all starts with, with God. Um, we know what the scriptures say about Jesus in Colossians 1.17, that Jesus is before all things. So if we want vision, we got to remember, Jesus, you're before what I see. I need to know what you see. So it starts with Jesus. And, and, and we know this in scripture, that um, God has a pretty incredible vantage point, right? God is able to see everything. Um, in all places, uh, at all times, um, in an all-encompassing, eternal way that only God can. Um, I think of Proverbs 15.3, which says this, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and on the good. Hebrews 4.13 says that no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And so that's where it starts. Um, vision starts with what God sees as, as the one who has this singular vantage point of seeing 
all. That's where it starts. Uh, it needs to start with what God sees. And we see this as a theme throughout Scripture, whether it's, uh, whether it's Nehemiah, um, whether it's Isaiah, I think especially of Moses in the book of Exodus. Before there was Moses, this deliverer with this vision of, of leading God's people free from oppression, the Bible tells us in Exodus that the cries of the people, the cries of their oppression, it, it rose up to heaven. God saw it. God saw their brokenness. It starts with what God sees. I think of Jesus with the disciples who prior to, in Matthew 9, prior to him saying that the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, and encouraging his disciples to pray to the Lord of harvest, to send out laborers into his harvest, prior to that call, the Bible tells us that Jesus saw a multitude. And it says that he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. It, it begins with what God sees. But not only that, as we just reflected on, it also moves to what God shares in, what God feels. God doesn't just see, but God also shares. That's what's amazing about God. He sees the brokenness, but because He's not an emotionless God, because He's not apathetic, because He's holy and good, He breaks over the effects of sin. His heart is broken. He feels the pain of what he sees. This is such good news um, that God doesn't just see problems, but he feels problems. We live in a day and age where suffering is so an evil and tragedy, whether it be um, mass shootings or, or, or whether it be just loss in our own world, suffering and hardship, it, it's so, it can become so predominant that it becomes normal and it's just what we know it's what we see but God does not get used to brokenness and God does not become apathetic to it and he doesn't get numb to it like we do what's amazing about God is he feels the pain he feels the brokenness he weeps with those who weep that's what we see in scripture as the heart of God we see a God that when he sees his people in Egypt oppressed he feels their their pain and his heart breaks for that. So it goes from what God sees to what God shares. Jesus sees the multitude and he's filled with compassion. See, but when God shares in something, what's also so good about God is he does something about it. He doesn't just see the broken man, the beat up man on the side of the road and feel their pain and, and move on. He, he, he's provoked to action. Now the way that God has, has moved and the way that God moves today in, in such an, an incredible uh, act of his grace is he... He uses broken people. <laughs> um, and so this is the next step that, God, that we see when it comes to vision. It starts with what God sees. It moves to how God shares in what he sees. But then we see that God begins to search. God searches. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16:9 that the eyes of the Lord, these eyes that see all and his heart that feels all, now his eyes, they, they, they move to and fro throughout the earth, searching for hearts that are loyal to him through which he can show himself strong. And we see this as, as, a, as a, an act of God's grace all throughout Scripture, that God is looking for people. Not perfect people, not capable people, but available people and willing people that He could use as vessels to accomplish His purposes. So God sees, God shares, God searches, and then we see God selects. Not only does He search for people, but He chooses people. Um, we see that as another theme all throughout Scripture, that God chooses individuals for certain tasks and certain purposes. Now, let's be reminded of who those kind of people are, because they're not always the people that we would select, right? The way that Paul describes in, it in 1 Corinthians 1 is, it's often the weak things of this world, the foolish things of this world. It's David, who was the eighth son that wasn't even lined up before Samuel as one of the sons of Jesse, it's broken people like you and like me, whether it's Noah, the drunk, <laughs> or Moses, the murderer, or David, the shepherd boy, the youngest, or Paul, the terrorist, the, the persecutor. We see the grace of God in selecting empty vessels of normalness and weakness to display his awesomeness and his power. Uh, we certainly see this through Jesus' selection of the twelve. 
who weren't exactly, if there was like a, a, a disciple draft, right, in this day and age, <laughs> they weren't exactly at the top of the class. They, they, they probably weren't the first round, second round. They probably weren't in any round if there was a, a, a modern day version of this draft. They weren't at the, uh, the top of the religious elite. They didn't have it all together. These are everyday dudes. Uh, as John MacArthur says, they were 12 ordinary men that God did extraordinary things through because they were available. Um, so God sees, God shares, and then God searches, and then God selects the foolish things of this world, and those that He selects, God shows. He, he reveals, as Paul prayed, He opens our eyes to see what He sees. He gives us a vision of what He sees. And this is so fundamental when it comes to ministry, to be able to see what God sees. Um, I've heard it said this way before, that having a vision without a task is a visionary. That makes a visionary. Having a task without a vision, well, that's a drudgery. Doing something, you know, kind of the nine to five and just sort of checking in and punching, punching keys and not really having any goals or, or passion behind it, that's a drudgery. But a vision with a task makes a missionary. Someone that not only has a calling, but they have a vision that not only propels the calling, but it steers the calling. It sustains the calling. It motivates the calling. And that's what God seeks to do. He calls people in that way. He, shows, he first shows them what He sees and what He shares in. And then what God does is He stirs. He takes that, that person who He's revealed what He sees to and he stirs their heart to feel what he feels about it. As the, the song, the classic song uh, goes, he, he breaks our heart for what breaks his. He entrusts us with his burdens. He entrusts us with his compassions. Um, I think of Nehemiah as a great example of this. You know, Nehemiah, in the book of Nehemiah, there, there's not one verse in that book that says, Then the Lord spoke to Nehemiah, and a voice from heaven said, Go and build that wall. I mean, there's nothing in there uh, about this, this loud voice. But the way that God used Nehemiah was, the Bible says that God put it in his heart to build this wall. It was in his heart. God put it in his heart. God began to stir Nehemiah's heart. Um, but what God then does is He develops that stir into a call, and God sends. He sends. He takes that burden with a vision, and He gives it a mission. He gives it a task, and He propels us to, with that burden and with that vision, to be about the work of God, and at the end of the day, just to be able to experience the thrill of watching God work. Um, so that's the process that we see in Scripture. You know, it begins with God. All vision starts with Jesus. It's what God sees. Uh, it moves to what God shares in, what God feels about what He sees. And then we see that, that because God does something about what He sees, and because He's really gracious and He desires to work through normal means like people to display His glory, we see that God searches he looks for hearts that are available, for lives that are available. And then upon those available lives, He selects the foolish things of this world that He can Himself reveal what He sees to. And then He stirs those hearts to feel what He feels and then sends them out as laborers into His harvest, ultimately for His glory. So um, our prayer should be, and my prayer for you would be, that just as Paul prayed that, that God... Um, he would, in His grace, deem us available <laughs> to be used. And as He deems us available to be used for His purposes, He would reveal. He would open the eyes of our heart. He would gift us with the Spirit, the, the, the Holy Spirit's illuminating work, that we would have these eyes and, and this, this understanding of what He sees, but it would lead us to actually be stirred. We would be broken for what breaks His heart. And then that, therefore, would propel us and it would steer us in our calling and serving Him. So I hope that blesses you. I hope that's able to guide you along your way as you're leading and you're seeking vision from God. Um, he has it. He sees it. Uh, we should go to Him for it.
Anyway, uh, I pray that is helpful to you, and uh, may God bless you. You're listening to One Piece of Advice, brought to you by eeleaders.com, a ministry to encourage and equip church leaders. Hey guys, Jim Gallagher, Calvary Chapel, Vero Beach. Um, Daniel Williams asked me if I would just take a few minutes and share a brief encouragement to pastors. And uh, so I'm going to take the opportunity to do that. And what I want to encourage you in most is that uh, long before you were called to be a pastor, you were called to be a Christian. And one of the things uh, that we recognize is there are some struggles that are unique to pastoral ministry. There are you know, things that you face because you're in pastoral ministry that you wouldn't face if you weren't in pastoral ministry, much in the same way that if you were a coal miner, you would have the struggles that are unique to coal mining. Um, but I think regardless of what you're called to or where you're called to, so you may be in, in, a, in an area of ministry where things are being very fruitful right now and uh, you're kind of seeing the, the, the effect of all of the, the investment that you've made into lives and people are growing and things are being established. Or you may be in, in that time where you're still you know, swinging the proverbial pickaxe and just kind of trying to break up the fallow ground. Um, wherever you're at, your relationship with Jesus is, needs to be the primary thing. Uh, that, you know, when you stand before the Lord, I don't think that we'll be standing before him uh, primarily as pastors. I think we'll be standing before him as his children. We'll be standing before him as people who were saved by his grace and we're just supposed to walk with him and listen to him and, and do what he says. And, and one of the things that can become really discouraging in ministry is when we start to measure ourselves by the lack of or the abundance of the fruit of what we do rather than measuring ourselves just by the fact that we're a child of God. And so I want to encourage you in that. I'd encourage you to, to make sure that you keep your devotional life healthy, that uh, you wake up in the morning and that when you're looking at the passage of Scripture, it's not for uh, primarily for a, um, an illustration in next week's sermon, but it's for what God may want to speak to you and how you might apply that. Uh, in your own personal life, with your wife, with your children, uh, with your sphere of influence, and, and focus on that. And, and then I'd also like to encourage you as, as you go out that while your primary ministry is the local church that you're pastoring or, or the uh, area of ministry within that local church that you're responsible for, uh, you're also part of a community. And you know, look for ways to stay connected in the community. Look for ways to develop relationships with people that don't yet know the Lord and, and keep that fresh so that uh, you always are having opportunity to share the Lord with others. You're always having people to pray for. You're, uh, you're gonna find that that will be reproduced in, in your people as well. So keep following Jesus, keep loving him and uh, until he comes, God bless you guys. Well, these messages were such great reminders of seeking Jesus for vision. And for many of us, we have a clear calling and vision from God. We have fasted, we've prayed, and we've heard from the Lord, and now we're just walking in obedience. And so on the next episode of Leadership Lessons, I interview my friend Bruce Zachary on alignment. And I really ask him the questions of like, well, how as leaders do we implement this vision? What's the difference between a mission statement and a vision statement? And how do we align other people around that and even align our church around where we think God is calling us to do? And so it is full of amazing content that I am sure is going to help many of you. And I so look forward to next week as we'll be discussing alignment with Bruce Zachary. And so until next time, just keep seeking Jesus, and I pray that you're encouraged. Be blessed. Thank you so much for listening to this Leadership Lessons podcast. You can watch all the episodes and get all the show notes at eeleaders.com. If this podcast was a blessing to you, I would love for you to share it with your friends on social media. You can find us on social media at eeleaders. You can also help us spread the word by simply writing a review on iTunes or Google Play. My hope for you with this podcast is that it will encourage you and equip you to continue to serve Jesus. Because remember, there's nothing better than doing what God has called you to do.